Welcome to Moments Orthodox Presbyterian Church for our morning worship service in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Several announcements today. I want to start with a little bit of a recap of Presbytery meeting, which was this last week. Um, Grace Church in Hanover Park now has a pastor. Um, his name is Chris Barnard. He was ordained and um, received into Presbytery. His installation is coming. There was another transfer, Mr. John Carter, uh, who was a commander in the Navy, um, a chaplain for many years, and is now uh, located in our presbytery. Also, Mr. Jeremy Chong came under care of the presbytery. Um, he is a member of Orland Park and is a student at Mars, um, and also a member of the Jim Elliott Fellowship, uh, the Evangelistic Fellowship. Also, we have the sad duty of um, demitting from the ministry uh, Mr. Ken Golden, who is um, taking a direction towards Eastern Orthodoxy. So uh, that was a very sad conversation that we had uh, with him and about him. Um, so those are main highlights. I moderated most of the meeting. Um, Alan Strange's voice was uh, on the fritz, so he um, moderated only one of the reports. Other announcements, uh, we'll be serving the Lord's Supper today. Um, mark your calendars for two events. March 25th, Saturday at 5.30 is game night here at the church. And also Friday, April 28th, 7 to 9, Reform Mission Services are having their bowling fundraiser up, up in Dyer, Indiana. And you can sign up for that online. Also, our Reformation Translation Fellowship, they request prayers for their ongoing projects, including a Spanish Psalter, uh, some Hindu translations, and then also some of uh, R.C. Sproul's commentaries being translated to other languages. And the giving for February is uh, listed in the bulletin. Let's prepare our hearts and minds now for the worship of the living God with silent prayer. salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be among us today. Please turn with me to hymn number 34, the God of Abraham praise, number 34.
Our expository reading for the morning is 2 Chronicles chapter 19, which you can find on page 437 in the Church Bible. Jehoshaphat, as you uh, probably remember from last time, had allied himself with Ahab, the northern king, and now he gets uh, criticized for that by Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer. And the idea here is that Jehoshaphat had been operating, sort of, under at least, under the fear of man. And he was supposed to fear God. Well, in the rest of the chapter, we see that Jehoshaphat actually repents of that. Because when he installs uh, priests and Levites to give judgment for the Lord and dis to decide disputed cases, he tells them, you need to fear the Lord and you need to make sure you're not being biased and you're not receiving bribes and that you are judging according to the justice that God has revealed in his word. So this is, a, this is an excellent picture of what repentance looks like. Hear now the word of our God. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned in safety to his house in Jerusalem. But Jehu, the son of Hanani the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, wrath has gone out against you from the Lord. Nevertheless, some good is found in you, for you destroyed the, the Asherot out of the land, and have set your heart to seek God. Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem. They went out again among the people from Be'er Sheba to the hill country of Ephraim and brought them back to the Lord, the God of their fathers. He appointed judges in the land in all the fortified cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, Consider what you do, for you judge not for man but for the Lord. He is with you in giving judgment. Now then let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be careful what you do, for there is no injustice with the Lord our God or partiality, or taking bribes. Moreover, in Jerusalem, Jehoshaphat appointed certain Levites and priests and heads of families of Israel to give judgment for the Lord and to decide disputed cases. They had their seat at Jerusalem, and he charged them, Thus you shall do in the fear of the Lord, in faithfulness and with your whole heart, whenever a case comes to you from your brothers who live in their cities, concerning bloodshed, law, or commandment, statutes, or rules, then you shall warn them that they may not incur guilt before the Lord, and wrath may not come upon you and your brothers. Thus you shall do, and you will not incur guilt. And behold, Amariah the chief priest is over you in all matters of the Lord, and Zavadiah the son of Ishmael, the governor of the house of Judah, in all the king's matters, and the Levites will serve you as officers. Deal courageously. And may the Lord be with the upright. I invite you to turn with me in the Psalter hymnals, number 40, verse 40a. We'll sing verses 6 through 10 of 40a.
the Lord our God in prayer. O Lord our God, you who are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are great above the heavens and above the earth. You are great in heaven itself, with the cherubim and seraphim surrounding you, the souls of those now made perfect, the apostles and the prophets <coughs> singing your praises. We desire, Father, to enter into that worship as we can as creatures by your grace. You are our Father. You have created us. You are the Father of all mercies, the God of all consolation. You are the one from whom, through whom, and to whom are all things. You are also the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ, who with you is worshipped and glorified as true God from true God. We thank you, Father, that you sent him to earth, that he was always your delight, that you were well pleased in him, and that in him all the fullness of the Godhead does dwell bodily. We thank you, Father, that in Christ we can be your adopted children. And in him, the natural son, we can be adopted as heirs, heirs of all things. We thank you that you chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that in the bounty of your grace, the overflowing nature of your mercy towards us, you have lavished on us in all wisdom and understanding the great benefits of salvation in Christ. You have given us Christ himself to be the one who saves us and who feeds us and who is our all in all. We desire, Father, to believe more firmly always. We believe and we ask you to help our unbelief. We ask you to make us aware of our idolatries and that you would mortify them in us, put them to death, enable us to struggle against them too so that the Holy Spirit might have full reign in our lives. We praise you that we have been born again, not by the will of human beings, but by your power and by your Spirit. We pray, Father, that you will help us to live our lives as you have called us to do to seek the things above. We know our citizenship is in heaven, but we ask, Father, that our life, our lives will be a prelude to that heaven. Help us to live with a view to the future, that what is going to be true of us will govern us today that what we will be as perfected human beings, that that will be what we strive for by your grace. We know, Father, that we sin and we need forgiveness for this perfecting grace to be ours. And we know also, Father, that, it, that though it cannot be achieved in this life, that there still can be progress. We thank you for that. We pray that you will encourage our souls and our minds and our, our bodies so that we may serve you with all of who we are. We pray that you will enable us to throw off the sin that so easily entangles us, to win the battles against our sin nature, 
and against the temptations that our sin nature and also Satan and his demons put in front of us. We thank you that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who gave us life by his death. We pray, Father, for the church, for its mission, that it will make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and do so under your authority as our great shepherd, the one to whom all authority in heaven and on earth has been given. We pray, Father, that you will bless us with increasing spiritual health in particular, that we will follow your ways, that we will love to study your word, that we will learn and grow in Jesus Christ, and that you will preserve us to the end. We pray for those who cannot be with us today and ask your mercies to be richly poured out upon them. For those who need healing, we ask that you will grant it. For those who need encouragement, we pray that you will grant that in the Holy Spirit, the great comforter. We pray, Father, that you will be with those who do not know Jesus, whether they're here today with us or whether they're out in the community, and that your love will be displayed at the cross and the empty tomb for these people and they will see that they need Jesus and that they will repent and come in faith to you. We pray that our worship will be acceptable to you and we pray that your Holy Spirit will be present with us. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please turn with me to hymn number 679. We'll stand and sing, "'Tis so sweet, to trust in Jesus, 679.
Let us pray. O Lord our God, we come to you to learn from you what faith is, in whom we have faith, what faith does, and we pray that you will enlighten us by your Holy Spirit's power and show us the glories of our Savior, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to turn in the scriptures to Romans chapter 4, which you can find on page 1119. We'll be looking at verses 18 through 22. Romans chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, hear God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. In hope, he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. The pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church for many years, Donald Gray Barnhouse, was once invited back to Princeton Seminary where he had studied to preach to the student body. And his old Hebrew teacher, Robert Wilson, came to hear him preach. At the close of the meeting, the old gentleman came up to Barnhouse and cocked his head on one side in his characteristic way extended his hand and said, If you come back, I will not come to hear you preach. I only come once. I am glad that you are a big godder. When my boys come back, I come to see if they are big godders or little godders. And then I know what their ministry will be. Barnhouse asked him to explain. So he replied, Well, some men have a little god and they are always in trouble with him. He can't do any miracles. He can't take care of the inspiration and transmission of the scripture to us. He doesn't intervene on behalf of his people. They have a little God, and I call them little Godders. Then there are those who have a great God. He speaks, and it is done. He commands, and it stands fast. He knows how to show himself strong on behalf of them who fear him. You have a great God, and he will bless your ministry. Well, that's really the question. For us today, what kind of God do we have faith in? A little God or a big God? And this determines the kind of faith that we will have as well. Here's an easy, simple illustration. Imagine you've got two chairs. One of them is strong and sturdy, well-made and even comfortable. The other is rickety, frail and about to fall <coughs> apart and looks quite uncomfortable. You look at these two chairs. Which chair do you want to sit in? Which chair do you know will support your weight? If you have a bad chair, your faith in that chair will not come to much. That chair won't last very long before it breaks into many small pieces. But if your faith is in the sturdy chair, you'll be able to sit in it for years. So what kind of God we believe in will determine what kind of faith we have. What kind of faith is it? What is the nature of that faith that we claim to have? When we ask the question about faith, we are also then, and at the same time, asking, what kind of God do we believe in? So those are the questions we have for ourselves this morning. What kind of faith do we have? And what kind of God do we do we believe in? And those questions are really two sides of the same coin, very closely connected. The first thing we see about faith in our passage is that true faith is not fooled by appearances, but rather believes God's promise. Paul is continuing to tell us the story of Abraham because he's the father of all 
who believe, whether circumcised or not, and why the story of Abraham is important for us in the New Testament. In verse 18, Paul tells us that Abraham had to face many obstacles in the way of his faith. Look at how he says it. In hope, he believed against hope. Another way of saying it would be against all human expectations, Abraham believed that God's word would come to pass. Humanly speaking, there wasn't much to hope for. But what was the promise? That Abraham would be the father of many nations. Now, if Abraham wanted to become discouraged, he had no lack of fodder for promoting that discouragement, did he? All he had to do was look at the circumstances. He was old. He was 100 years old. Maybe Paul had a little smile on his face when he wrote, his body was as good as dead. When Abraham looked at it, old and worn out. And of course, his wife was 90 years old and had been barren her whole life, and she was well past childbearing years. That would have sunk many people into despair. Would it sink our faith? It's easy to let circumstances do that, isn't it? We often feel so helpless in our circumstances. Think of Peter walking on the water as soon as he saw where he was, and he saw the wind and the waves, and took his eyes off of Jesus, he started sinking. And there is a certain human logic to that, isn't there? Because we are, in fact, pretty helpless in our circumstances a lot of the time. But God is not. And that is what Abraham knew. Despite every appearance, God was able to keep his promise. And you see, God made it happen that way so that the glory of his promise being fulfilled would be completely of God and not of human effort. So, what do we despair of? Maybe it's despair that our church could ever really grow. Maybe it's despair that someone we know seems to have thrown off the Christian faith and gone their own way. Maybe it's despair that God cannot love us anymore because of the things we have done. But do we believe in a God who brings life from the dead. He did it for Abraham, who was as good as dead. He did it for Sarah. God brought life out of death. He gave them Isaac. He raised up Jesus Christ from the dead. You know, a lot of people think in liberal circles today, all oh, those early people, they're so gullible about the resurrection from the dead. They believed in any old miracle. Actually, that's not true. Everybody in the first century knew that people did not come back from the dead. They weren't gullible. They weren't stupid back then. But that's exactly what happened in God's power. Jesus is alive. So what are the things in our lives that are tempting us to waver? What kind of circumstances are we looking at that seem insurmountable. And we ask then, are there really any obstacles at all to the power of God? We should stop being fooled by appearances too. We should instead trust in the promise of God. Now, God may not give us what we think we need. And just because God happens to say no to a prayer of ours, doesn't mean that his arm has grown short or that he is unable to. It might just mean that his plan is different from what we expect. But the point here is that we need to stop thinking of human circumstances as any kind of obstacle in God's way. God 
can utter a word, and that obstacle is toast. We have a big God, not a little one. Secondly, true faith is not a leap in the dark. True faith is not a blind leap of faith into the dark. Rather, true faith takes account of the situation, but is not fooled by appearances. We've just said faith is not fooled by the circumstances, and that's true. But some people might take that idea too far and say, well, if my faith can't be fooled by appearances, then I should just ignore the situation completely and take the blind leap of faith. And that's what a lot of people think faith is. But that is not biblical faith, and our text says so in verse 19. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body. Did he just ignore that circumstance? No, he didn't ignore it. He saw it, but then the faith wasn't limited by it. You see the difference? Blind leap of faith is like, well, I don't care what, what's going on. I don't care what the circumstances are. I'm just going to leap. I hope somebody catches me. That's not what Abraham did. He didn't try to hide his head in the sand and ignore the problems. That's not actually faith. That would be ignorance, stupidity even. True faith looks at all the facts, but then says, no matter how difficult an obstacle that might seem to us, God's power to overcome those obstacles is infinite. Faith is not a leap into the dark. In fact, one author put it very well when he said, faith is not a leap into darkness, but a leap out of darkness. Real darkness is in thinking that this world is the only one there is. That these circumstances are the only things that matter. That my spiritual darkness is completely impenetrable, even to God. That results in a very small world and a very small God, if he's even there at all. Real darkness is in either failing to face the real circumstances or being completely roadblocked by those circumstances and allowing them to limit God in our own minds. Faith looks at the circumstances and then realizes God is bigger than those circumstances. He's always bigger. So are we little godders or big godders? And having a big God does not mean ignoring the circumstances. We're just not fooled by them either. There's an excellent illustration of how these two principles work together. That we don't ignore the circumstances, but we're not fooled by them either. We can compare and contrast the ten bad spies and the two good spies that went into the land of Canaan. There were twelve all told, if you recall. They went to the land of Canaan, and when they came back, ten of the spies talked about how big the people were in the land, that they were like grasshoppers. They talked about how advanced the technology of these Canaanites was, how impossible it would be for Israel to go in and take over the land. Now, those ten spies, well, they took into account the difficulties, but then they were fooled by them, weren't they? They didn't go beyond the circumstances at all. Caleb and Joshua saw all the same things that the other ten spies had seen. But they knew their God was so much bigger than the so-called giants living in the land. It didn't matter how many people there were. And it didn't matter how big they were. Joshua and Caleb knew God was fighting on their side. They faced up to the facts. But they didn't let the facts intimidate them, as it were, into denying their faith in God. Faith is not fooled by circumstances, but it takes into account the circumstances. Thirdly, faith does not waver in unbelief. Verse 20 tells us this about Abraham's faith. 
He did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Now here we run into a very serious problem. Because it's easy to react to this by saying, oh, well, that's great for Abraham, but wasn't he one of the most faithful people who ever lived? I don't have a faith as strong as that. And if you're expecting me to have a faith as strong as that in order for it to be genuine faith, then there's no way I can make it. Ironic, isn't it? Such thinking would be a great example of someone looking at circumstances and being overwhelmed by them rather than fixing their eyes on Jesus Christ. In the days before GPS, when farmers had to drive their tractors themselves, there was really only one way to get a straight line in whatever row you were planting or plowing. And that was to keep your eye fixed on some point beyond the end of the row so that you aim straight forward. And if you look behind you too much, your hand might swerve on the wheel, tractor would make a small move, and your line wouldn't be straight anymore. Of course, you had to look behind every now and then. But if you're going to stay straight, you have to keep your eyes fixed on that point ahead of you. We sing this Sunday evening, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Even that hymn, it's not denying the things in the world, is it? It's not saying, just ignore all of those things. But don't allow them to cloud your picture of Jesus. And this is true even of people with small faith. Jesus tells us if we have faith as small as a mustard seed, we could tell a mountain to be removed into the heart of the sea and it would happen. And the real question is this, would such power be true because of how strong our faith is or because of how strong our God is? To ask the question is to answer it, but maybe another illustration will help. If you have a car that is in perfect condition and will get you where you want to go, does it matter really how strongly you believe it will? Whether you doubt the state of your car or not, the car will still do its job as long as you turn the key in the ignition, put the car in gear, and drive it away. Whether the car will go as far as you need it to go doesn't depend on how well you believe it will, but on the state of the car itself. Unbelief, then, would be, well, I'm just not going to use the car. And that's where the threshold it is. As long as you decide to drive the car, and that car is in good condition, the car will carry you. How much more trustworthy is our God than any car? Unlike cars, our God will never break down, will never run out of gas or electricity. So as long as we actually put our faith in him, then God is our God, whether our faith in him is strong or weak. As long as it's genuine, he will be our God. But that raises the next question, doesn't it? How do we know that our faith is genuine? There's a lot of answers to that question and a lot of aspects to that question. But one thing we can ask is this. If God says something, do we believe it? When Jesus died, do we believe he did that for us and in our place? And here, it doesn't depend on how emotional we feel about it, although emotions will probably be attended with that. It doesn't depend on us trying to manipulate ourselves into thinking that we believe it. It's far more simple than that. Are our eyes fixed on Jesus? You see, when we focus attention on ourselves, that's when we get overloaded with circumstances, isn't it? But when we fix our eyes on Jesus, all the troubles that do exist... 
They become small in the light of Jesus' glory and greatness. So, faith is not fooled by appearances. Faith takes into account the circumstances. Faith does not waver into unbelief. And fourthly and lastly, faith gives glory to God. In verse 20, Paul tells us that Abraham was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. I'm convinced that giving glory to God is a much larger category in the Christian life than we often think it is. It's not merely worship that gives glory to God. It's everything we do that is for God. Faith is a busy, active thing, as Martin Luther tells us. And everything that faith produces in our lives goes to, feeds into, giving glory to God. In reality, one could say that everything we do as Christians that we do by faith gives glory to God. Now, that's a very large view of the glory of God, isn't it? Well, what did Abraham do by faith to give glory to God? Well, he moved out of Ur of the Chaldees when God told him to. He offered up Isaac when God told him to. Abraham believed God when God told him to. He did what God told him to do and believed what God told him to believe. That always gives glory to God. What has God told us to do and believe? It's all here in the Bible, isn't it? And if we want to know what God's will is for our lives, and now we can give glory to God, we've we got to keep reading and studying this book, don't we? Every part of it. Not just the parts that we like. And we need to get rid of the idea once and for all that we could ever exhaust the meaning of this book as it's communicated to us by an infinite God. You don't ever come to the end of reading the scriptures after reading it for a year and say, well, I've got that done. I don't need to do this anymore for the rest of my life. This is like an everlasting onion, layer after layer after layer. I'll never come to the end of it. And it's all parts of Scripture. Every part of Scripture. Paul tells us this in 2 Timothy. All Scripture is profitable for us. Not just some parts of it. The parts we like, all of it. Faith believes every word God says. Faith does everything God commands. And that's the true nature of faith. It looks up to God, the truly big God we serve. Do we have a big God or a little God? Is our God smaller or bigger than our circumstances? May we have a faith then that acknowledges circumstances but always looks beyond them to our great and powerful God who brings life after death and out of death. May we always give glory to God through our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power and the glory and all of your mighty attributes that you have and you've revealed to us. O Lord, enable us always to believe in you, the one who controls all things, who is sovereign over all things, and who is thus a God beyond our comprehension. You have shown this, Father, in the death of your Son, Jesus, which is not an event any human could have dreamed up as the solution for sin, but in your great plan, it is mighty and powerful to save. And we pray now as we come to the supper that you will be glorified through this sign and symbol of our faith, that you will strengthen this faith to do what your scripture has shown us it must do. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn with me to hymn number 420. At the Lamb's High Feast we sing, number 420.
invite the elders to come forward for the celebration of the Lord's Supper. One of the most gracious things that God has revealed to us is that he knows how small our faith is. And this sacrament is proof of that. He knows that it's really difficult to keep on believing in the God we cannot see. Well, we can see what he does, but we can't see him. But he's given us this sign to help us in that faith, so that the faith will be strengthened, so that it won't be overcome by circumstances, but we'll see past that to the God who's bigger than all of them. And he's bigger than all of them because he is a God who can bring life out of death. Here we celebrate what Christ's death means for us, that it means salvation, that it means forgiveness of sins, that he, he was a substitute for us. And so we celebrate the goodness of God, his grace, his favor, and how big he is too. In now the words of institution from 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. Now well, this supper is for Christ's lambs, those who have been saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ from their sin. As for those who have publicly proclaimed that faith in the Lord Jesus and are members in good standing of a church that preaches Christ crucified and raised from the dead. For those who are not members, we ask you to stay and watch, but not to partake, because we need this is for the body of Christ, for those who have proclaimed their faith in the Lord Jesus. If you have something against neighbors, then this supper is also not for you until you have reconciled with your neighbor. But this is not meant to discourage penitent sinners from coming to the table. Because as we said in the preparation, it's not as though we come to this supper righteous in ourselves, but to testify that we are sinners and that Christ's blood forgives us. Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me, hear that your soul may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David.
Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. body of Christ broken for you. Do this in remembrance of him. After supper, Christ took the cup and again, when he had given thanks, he said, This is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink all from it. Grape juice is on the inside. Wine is on the outside. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and I shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall never be cut off. Jesus Christ, drink all from it. Let us pray. O Lord, you are good to us. Your grace is beyond our understanding. In understanding, you prove that you understand us. And you have given us this sign to strengthen our faith, to look to you, for all things, to look beyond circumstances even while taking them into account. We pray that you will help us, strengthen us so that we will not waver, but will give glory to you always. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. Let us now pray for our tithes and offerings. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the faith that you have instilled in us and given to us. And we pray that this will be a testimony of our faith, these tithes and offerings, that everything we have is from you and goes back to you. For you are the Lord of heaven and earth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
and stand for God's blessing and benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Savior, through you, Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen.